everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be after today, tomorrow. I'd like to welcome Matt to the virtual stage to introduce our next speaker. Hi, my name is Matt Pruitt, and I'm very pleased to welcome Michael Albert. Michael Albert is a founder and current member of the staff of Z Magazine, as well as staff of Z Magazine's web system, Z Communications, including ZNet. Albert's radicalization occurred during the 1960s. His political involvements starting then and continuing to the present have ranged from local, regional, and national organizing projects and campaigns to co-founding South End Press, Z Magazine, the Z Media Institute, and ZNet, and to working on all these and other projects, writing for various publications and publishers, giving public talks, etc. Albert is the author of over 20 books, including Fanfare for the Future, Remembering Tomorrow, Realizing Hope, Pericon, Life After Capitalism, and Practical Utopia. Many of Albert's articles are stored in ZCom and can be accessed there along with thousands of other Z Magazine and ZNet articles, essays, and interviews. Thank you so much for being here, Michael. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate the invitation. This is a little unusual for me. Um, <laughs> I usually look at an audience, and now I'm looking at you and me, um, which is a little less than the uh, than the kind of feedback one wants to have as a speaker. But let's see what we can do. My my topic is a good economy for a good society, and I guess the first thing to ask is why bother talking about that? That is to say, we're not going to have a good economy for quite a while, so why should we talk about it now? And uh, I think, at least for me, there are three reasons. One is because it helps uh, give us direction. It orients us toward what we're trying to arrive at. It helps us to figure out demands and actions and, and consciousness raising that leads towards where we want to go. And the second thing is there's a, there's a slogan, plant the seeds of the future in the present, create projects which sort of exemplify where it is you want to go. And you can't know the seeds of the future unless you know something about the future, and that's another reason for talking about a good economy for a good society. And finally, and I think this might actually be most important, is an issue of morale. There's an issue of overcoming cynicism and doubt about the possibility of anything better. And you overcome that, I think, ultimately, by describing what that better can be and why it's viable. Um, now, how do you do that? Well, I think different people do it in different ways. For me, uh, the way I think about it is, well, what do I want an economy to accomplish? And then what kinds of institutions does an economy have to have to accomplish those things? Um, I can only give an overview, partly because that's all the time we have, and partly because I don't even want to use all the time. I want to leave some time uh, for questions and discussion. So I'll do the best I can to prevent, present an overview. and then. You know, in the, in the questions that you raise, you could ask me to defend it because you find something un unconvincing or you think it might be even bad, um, to elaborate it or whatever really you want. So <clears throat> an economy produces and distributes, we're told by economists, uh, goods and services. And that's certainly true. An economy does do that. But the interesting point is that it does something more. It produces people and social relations. So in the act of economic life in production and consumption and allocation, it isn't just things or services that go back and forth. People come in the door in the morning and they come out at night and over the course of a year and years, they're changed. Uh, they're changed by virtue of the activities that they engage in in their economic lives, in the workplace. And the same vis-a-vis uh, -vis consumption or allocation. So one kind of change that occurs, one kind of area in which economies profoundly affect us is how decisions are made. Uh, what kind of say, what kind of influence, what kind of say do we have in decisions? And we might ask, well, what kind of say do we want to have? What, what, do we, what do we believe that we should have? And some people will say democracy. One person, one vote, 50% rule, 50% plus one rule. Um, but I don't believe that. Uh, I think there are lots of decisions for which that makes no sense. Um, you work in a workplace, you go to work, um, you put a picture of your spouse or a friend on your table. Um, that's not a 50% plus one decision for the whole workplace. 
that's really a decision for you. And uh, you make it sort of like Stalin would make it, uh, alone as, a, as the sole decider. And then there are other decisions that are for a work team. And there are decisions that are for the whole workplace. And the idea here, I think, if we think it through, which we don't have time to do carefully, is that you want to have a say in decisions to the extent they affect you. You don't need more than that. You don't want to have a say way beyond the effect on you because that's sort of robbing the say that other people should have. And you don't want less than that because you want to be able to influence things in proportion as they affect you. That's a norm that can be applied and that uh, treats everybody the same and that I think works properly. Um, you might want to suggest that it won't get the best decisions in a question. Uh, and we can talk about that. But I think it will. I think it's a value. It, it, it's a desirable aim. Uh, and uh, we'll call it collective self-management. Well, what does that imply for institutions? Think of a workplace. If the workforce, if each member of the workforce, each worker, is going to have a say in decisions, essentially, roughly, in proportion to the degree that they're affected by those decisions, there has to be a place where workers can manifest their wills, when, where workers can um, work, talk together, uh, arrive at agendas, uh, arrive at proposals, discuss them, and vote on them with that degree of influence. And we call those workers' councils. So that's the first institutional structure for a good economy, I think, a venue for the people who are doing the work to manifest their preferences over what, what they will do and how they will do it. So workers' councils. But Decisions aren't all in one unit. Decisions are in whole industries and the whole economy. So networks and federations of workers' councils. And on the consumer side, which we won't talk about too much unless you raise it in questions, same thing, neighborhood councils, neighborhood consumption councils. So we have a vehicle now, and, and we, we have a kind of a, a the algorithm for making decisions. We try to make decisions sometimes by consensus, sometimes one person, one vote, 50% plus one. Sometimes maybe you need two thirds. Sometimes you do more or less deliberation. We're trying to uh, uh, approach the ideal of self-management, i.e. input into decisions in proportion as the degree you're affected. But now there's another step that's associated with attaining this goal, I think, another institutional step. You can have something um, de uh, designated to be the case, and yet it doesn't happen. So for instance, we're supposed to have one person, one vote democracy in our elections, and everybody has an equal say, and we don't have anything like that, not remotely like that, because of finances and because of the electoral college, because of various institutional structures. So to have uh, self-management, selves have to participate. Each person has to be participating. So if you think of a workplace, is there an impediment to that? And I think the answer is there's a very big impediment to that. So one impediment to that is if the workplace is owned by somebody who has absolute control over it. So, all right, we're going to rule that out. I'm going to rule that out, at least for my good economy. I don't believe in capitalists owning workplaces and as a result, having dominion over the lives of the workers there. In a way, even the dictators don't you know, setting the time at which workers can go to the bathroom. Stalin never even tried to do that. So uh, that, that kind of control has to be removed if each person's gonna have a say in decisions in proportion to the degree they're affected. But there's another problem. In contemporary economies, and this is true both of what's called 20th century socialism and capitalism, uh, we have a division of labor of a certain sort. And the sort is, it's, we can call it a corporate division of labor. And in this corporate division of labor, about 20% of the people who are doing tasks inside the workplace uh, are doing overwhelmingly empowering tasks. They're doing things that convey to them knowledge of what's going on, connections with other people, other people in the workplace, confidence, even energy. They're not exhausted. 80% of the population of the workplace does a different kind of task, disempowering, work that is fragmenting, work that's rote, work that's boring, work that is redundant, work that takes away your inclination to participate, that takes away your knowledge and your, your confidence and leaves you in a position 
to be subordinate. It's an interesting thing, but the, the school system mirrors this. But in any case, the point is that if you divide up work in such a way that 80% are empowered and 20% are not, 80% will dominate 20%, even if you say you're going to have self-management. And you can actually see this in workers' co-ops all over the place, where, <coughs> excuse me, where uh, uh, you're, you're, you have a, a workers' council and you have one person, one vote, and you try to implement democracy, but over time, fewer and fewer people there are there are voting, and the, the remaining ones are dominating decisions to their own advantage. And that's, that's this coordinator class over working class dynamic. Okay, uh, so, so that's uh, self-managing councils. And what do we do about the division of labor? Well, we replace it with something that I would like to call balanced job complexes. And the idea is simple, although getting wrapping one's head around it can be difficult. It's that instead of taking all the tasks in the workplace and giving all the empowering ones to 20% of the workforce and all the disempowering ones to 80%, we create jobs that are combinations of empowering and disempowering tasks so that each of us has a comparably empowering workplace. And as a result, our work experience, what the workplace does to us, it produces us, what the workplace does to us leaves us all comparably prepared to participate in decisions. And so we do. And so it's possible to have self-management because we are all ready and prepared and confident and energetic to participate. So that's another institutional change, a very big one, which re, in my view uh, eliminates, uh, uh, we're, we're getting rid of capitalists, eliminates the capital worker division of labor. I mean, the capital worker class hierarchy, then getting rid of the corporate division of labor and replacing it with balanced job complex gets rid of the coordinator class working class division. What about income? What do we do with income? What is income? Income is really your share of the social product. So in other words, if we work and we get paid and we get a salary and we take home income, well, what is that? It's a claim on stuff, um, maybe, maybe services, maybe material stuff, products. It's a claim on a part of the social product. So basically your, your income is your share that you're entitled to from the social product. Well, what determines income? Typically nowadays, Property determines it. If you own a lot of property, you get profits. Uh, I'm going to rule that out. That has nothing to do, in my mind, with a good economy. We don't want an economy in which a few people own more than millions of people, uh, get more income than millions of people. There's no moral justification for that. And there's also no economic justification for that. It's just a vulgar, grotesque structure. Okay, but, but what else is, determines income? Well, in a market system, power does. You take what you can get. In essence, you bargain, and the bargaining power that you bring enables you to take more income, more claim on the social product. So for instance, if you live in a racist society, then if you're in the group that is racially oppressed, uh, you have less power. In the racial oppressor, oppressor group, you have more. And in the bargaining exchange, you're gonna wind up with more stuff in the, in the, in the non, uh, racially oppressed group. Same thing for gender. Uh, same thing for any other similar hierarchy like that that exists. And most importantly, same thing if you have the power of empowerment, if you're in the coordinator class as compared to the working class, you're going to get more. Uh, you're going to have a bigger share of profit, of, of, of product, of the social product. And uh, that too, I think, has no moral basis and also no economic basis. It doesn't improve any the, the overall quality of life, the overall uh, productivity. It doesn't in, it improve anything that warrants improvement. What it does is to subordinate some to others. Uh, so what, what then do we want? Well, some socialists say we want to reward output. If you if you produce more for the social product, you should get back more from it. That sounds good. That sounds warranted. After all, if I produce more and I don't get it, somebody else is getting what I produce. If I produce less and I get more, then I'm getting something from somebody else. And that's true. Uh, and so it seems ethical, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because it says, if you work with better equipment, if you happen to be producing stuff that's more valued, if you 
happen to have a genetic endowment, in other words, you have certain kinds of traits which are highly productive, then you're going to get more. So on top of being born talented like Picasso or brilliant like Chomsky or um, physical like LeBron James and so on, in in, on top of the luck of that, we're going to shower you with wealth. Well, I don't see any reason to do that. I don't think it is a good incentive effect, and it creates another wide disparity uh, among people that has no ethical warrant. So I want to get rid of that. So what would it leave? It would leave that in a good economy, the, your income, your claim on the social product, should be a function of how long you work, how hard you work, and also the onerousness of the conditions under which you work, as long as you're doing something that's socially valued. I can't get income for doing something that's worthless, but I can get it if I'm doing something that's socially valued, and then I get it for how long, how hard, and the onerousness of conditions. It's interesting to note that in our economy, it's upside down. The longer you work, the harder you work, and the worse conditions you work under, most likely the lower income you get per hour. Why? Well, it's because those three traits, like income, right, are in our economy, in large part a function of the bargaining power that you have. So you get those um, worse conditions and longer hours and um, more intense labor, labor uh, because you, you don't have the power to say anything about it. And you also get low income for that. But in reality, what you should get is a higher income uh, for those reasons. Okay, I, I believe that um, um, we, we are, a big piece of the way toward a good economy. A good economy is not a, a blueprint of every single feature of an economy. Um, just like when somebody describes capitalism, they sure as hell aren't describing everything about our economy. But you describe the core institutions which sort of define and give the, the character of the whole thing. And so we have workers and consumers self-managing councils. We have balanced job complexes instead of corporate division of labor. We have equitable remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued work. And how do we tie it all together? So there's one more feature. And uh, economists will tell you, well, now you have to either have markets or central planning. Um, and my answer to that is, uh, we better not have to have those because each of them violates what we've just said we want. If we lay markets on top of what we've described, they will undo all the virtues. And the same for central planning. Central planning will undo them by virtue of authoritarianism, by virtue of a center commanding outcomes from a periphery. And that will undo self-management. And it will lead to income inequalities. And it will have other horrible effects as well. And, and markets is, is different, more subtle, uh, but also has these, these dynamics. Markets will create a situation in which uh, um, competition between units calls forth a division of labor, calls forth uh, a, a coordinator worker class, class hierarchy and interrupts uh, and, and in fact obliterates self-management and also um, uh, equitable remuneration. And so in place of those two familiar forms of allocation, uh, the, the the type of economy that we're talking about needs something new, and I call it participatory planning. And it's a kind of negotiated um, a determination of inputs and outputs. That's what allocation determines, uh, what's produced by each unit, um, what each unit takes in, and their allocation throughout the economy uh, by way of a budget. And uh, to replace markets and central planning, I think what we need is a kind of cooperative negotiation of the economic choices, which is the plan, but not centrally determined, cooperatively determined by the workers and consumers council. Now that's a lot to handle in, uh, I mean, all of this is very quick. That's particularly quick because that's the most complex feature. Um, and so if, if one is interested in the possibility of this, I wanna call it a participatory economy, you could call it participatory socialism, some people do. Um, it's a solidarity economy because the allocation system is such that people's interests are aligned instead of 
contrary to one another. That people get ahead by virtue of other people getting ahead, not by virtue of a zero sum game. So it's a solidarity com economy. It's a sustainable economy because the, the act of allocation takes into account the ecological and social and uh, personal and material uh, uh, costs. I am very sorry about that. Um, and uh, so does it does having this kind of a vision now have any value other than intellectual? Yes, as I, as I mentioned before, I think it can inform the kinds of demands we make, the way we organize, so that we wind up where we want to go. And that's not sort of an academic thing. In the past, oftentimes, people incredibly well-meaning and desiring to set up a wonderful economy have wound up with something very different than what they wanted. And so one has to, one has to orient one's actions to, to go where you want to go. You don't take a plane on a trip with no idea where the plane is going. You, 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 have, to, you have to take that into account. So that's a, a very quick, brief overview. Um, and I have 21 minutes instead of 20. And uh, hopefully now there'll be some questions which uh, will force me to fill out parts that you're interested in hearing filled out. If not, I'll just keep going. <laughs> great, uh, thanks. We've actually got a lot of great questions. Okay. And um, uh, I'll ask you a couple of my own to kick us off and then we'll sure. the audience questions. So. Uh, one, uh, I, I could I could go into um, specifics about lots of the things you talked about, but um, my my biggest sort of overall question is that the vision you described seems quite implementable to me. Um, the, the, I don't hear you describing anything that we can't um, that we can't build, that we can't put into an organization uh, that currently exists. So I'm wondering, you know. Um, what examples of existing organizations using this kind of uh, participatory planning, uh, w you know, would you point to? There's very little. I mean, you know, I have to I have to admit that it's the case. There are some groups that that favor this. There are some organizations that attempt to implement it in their own structure. <clears throat> what I have to do, I think, to answer you fairly, is explain why there are so few. In other words, what is the obstacle? You're saying, well, yeah. this seems like something to go for right away and, and maybe to implement in our own organizations now as well as to try for in the future. Well, I feel that way too, but there must be some obstacles. And the obstacles, I'll name two that I think are very big. One is, uh, would be familiar to everybody, just the opposite of your uh, optimism, downright cynicism, right? A feeling like you can't fight city hall, uh, there is no alternative. People suck. And so um, thinking about this kind of thing isn't even worth my time and, and people don't look at it closely. So that's one kind of obstacle. And that's a real serious obstacle, I think. But the other one is more subtle and in some ways more disturbing. And that's, well, imagine, imagine uh, some big uh, uh, progressive or left institution which thinks to itself, this sounds pretty good. What should we do? Well, one of the things we should do in the same sense as we don't wanna be racist. In other words, we want, to, we want a future that's not racist. So we're gonna try and eliminate racism inside our own operation. We want a future that's not sexist. So we're gonna try and eliminate sexism inside our own operation. Partly as a model, partly for our own good and partly because if we don't do that, we're gonna screw it all up anyway. Okay, so what would this suggest about that? This would suggest that we'd have to eliminate or work to eliminate the class division between what I'm calling a coordinator class and a working class. And that doesn't come so easily on the left, right? Um, for those who might already have, have, have thought about it, I think a Leninist approach to politics is basically an approach that leads to a coordinator class ruled economy, right? And, it, and is consistent with that. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who is going to resist getting rid of this class division is a, is a Leninist, doesn't mean that at all. But a lot of people will resist this on grounds that it's inefficient, on grounds that it's, ta it's taking away um, uh, decision-making power and um, uh, 
access to the most empowering tasks from people who should have those things, right? A lot of people will feel that. People at the heads of organizations will feel that. They will feel like they're gonna lose. And, and in a sense, they would lose something on behalf of winning something much, much larger. But you see what, what, I'm, what I'm driving at here. Um, and I think that that's, that's a significant part of it. All this stuff, everything we're gonna talk about is written about for those who wanna pursue any question further. Yeah, I mean, I think that my, uh, my inclination is to believe that if this kind of model empowers people, um, there will uh, be some kind of, of uh, efficiency upside that at least yeah. mitigates whatever downside uh, is, is, is. You're right. I mean, uh, it's, it's nice to be talking to somebody who's, who's, who's quick at that kind of uptake. But I mean, honestly, think of it this way, 20% monopolize empowering work. And we're saying, and this is literally what's being said, that that 20% has to do a share of the rote and repetitive and, and, and disempowering work. So that means a surgeon has to clean bedpans, right? A, a person who's gonna do surgery is not gonna do only surgery, they're gonna do a mix a per, and so on for other jobs. That's an obvious one that makes it clear. Well, the surgeon's gonna say, you're out of your mind, Michael, right? If I don't do it, people are shrewd. Right, people are people are losing valuable surgery, and what you're saying, I think, is well. Wait a second. Let's look at that other eighty percent. We're going to liberate that other eighty percent from being so subordinate and so denied and debilitated that their talents are going to come to the fore. And I think you're absolutely right. Right. And, and, and you're let me, let me just one last thing. The the surgeon might say, "No nonsense. The eighty percent can't do it. They are only equipped." to do rote work at our command. And that is 50 years ago, what men said about women and what whites said about blacks. And of course it was total nonsense, but it seemed to them to be the case because they saw women not doing that kind of activity. And they saw blacks not doing that kind of activity and they explained it via their own superiority and ability to do it. And I think it's exactly the same um, uh, even though it has nothing to do with race or gender, it's exactly the same for this class division, right? The people sure. who have the empowering work explain it as their own superiority, their own capacity, right? And the other groups incapacity, but it's false. Yeah, I mean, and I would, I would add to that, that I think people who, uh, uh, people who are operating near the tops of hierarchies are bad leaders if they don't understand what's going on beneath them in hierarchies. Um, you, you Unless know, they're out only for themselves, and then they're good leaders for themselves. Right, but for the institution, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so my next question is, you know, how do you, um, it's not, it's like, it's not crystal clear to me how you avoid um, oppression and domination from reasserting themselves within the context of the, of the kinds of, of uh, like workers councils you envision. Sure. Um, I'm trying to do everything so fast. I'd like to do a big story, but I can't. So uh, it's certainly the case that it's often true that workers will take over a factory in Argentina, not all that long ago, hundreds of factories. And they will say, we're going to institute full democracy. We're going to institute equitable remuneration. We're going to change our lives. And, and they start doing it. And then as you say, over time, something goes wrong. And here's what I would say. If you look at those cases, it turns out that while they've changed many things, they've left the old corporate division of labor. And it's the old corporate division of labor that reasserts itself, not bad human nature. It's that when they, when they, when they got together and said, okay, who's gonna do the finances? Somebody raised their hand and volunteered with all the well-meaningness in the world, right? But then over time, the people who are doing the empowering work start to see themselves as more important, start to see themselves as deserving better conditions, start to see themselves as deserving more income. And the people who are doing the rote work wanna get out of the work, they wanna go home because it's exhausting and it's deadening and it's not dignified. You know, they're, they're, they're treated as appendages to, to the real conceptual part. And so they stop voting. And the people who are voting start to vote 
uh, changes that are what you're describing, right? Sinking back into the old muck. And so I think that uh, a, a big piece of the solution is this, this issue of uh, changing the division of labor. But another piece of the solution is having equitable income and having an allocation system, which we can't really talk about, which makes it in everybody's interest for everybody else to do well. There is no, there's no way to get ahead off somebody else's going backwards, right? It's a sort of a collective endeavor in which you benefit mutually. And those, those two things, I think, will go a long way uh, toward automatically alleviating what seems like a really debilitating problem. Yeah, and, and this might be, um, you know, this might be a, a ill-informed question, but um, like w when you, w when the surgeon spends part of her time doing the bedpans, is this just, you know, the surgeon on is on bedpan duty sometimes, or is there an actual flattening of the hierarchy, right? Because you, you could, you could, you could divide up the labor in interesting ways while still having a, a hierarchy operating, yeah. right? The way I, I used to give the example, imagine that uh, uh, the people who live in a horrible neighborhood are allowed two days a month to go into the rich neighborhood and the people in the rich neighborhood have to spend those two days in the horrible neighborhood. Well, you haven't really done much of anything, right? Unless the people from the horrible neighborhood are smart enough to take home everything from the rich neighborhood. But otherwise you haven't really done much. No, what we're talking about here is that your job is changed. Your job is a mixture of tasks and the, the overall effect of the job that you have is comparable to the overall effect of the job that I have and that everybody else has. We do different things, of course, but the impact on us, uh, preparing us to be able to be participants in decision-making, right, is comparable. So whatever it is that in addition to surgery, the surgeon does, it's not a lark. It's a responsibility. And it isn't just them that are doing this. Because they're doing this, other people are doing surgery who weren't before, right? Not overnight, of course. Somebody's going to say, well, you can't become a surgeon overnight. Of course not. But, but the point is, everybody is doing a mix. So we're not just sort of reducing the situation of those at the top. We're elevating the situation of the others. And we're creating a situation which everybody is comparably empowered. So um, I, uh, uh, I, I had an interesting conversation with uh, Fred Turner yesterday, um, uh, who the media theorist who was talking about the ways that that communes uh, or the sort of the, the what he calls the new communalist movement went went awry um, as a result of of uh, or maybe not that might be oversimplifying but it, it you know they tried to flatten hierarchies they tried to get rid of hierarchies and in so doing they uh, created space for basically charismatic people, usually male, usually white, to assume uh, power that they, more power than they would have been able to assume in, in more institutional hierarchical frameworks. Um, uh, so it's in light of that kind of concern, it seems to me that in these, in these sorts of institutions that you envision, somebody needs to be enforcing the rules. Like some, somebody needs to be uh, holding other people accountable not just for their duties, but for their um, uh, for their uh, holding people accountable to their place in the hierarchy, so they don't, you know, cr create an off the books hierarchy. Basically, does that make sense? Yeah, the, it's certainly the case that you can't. Some people, when they talk about the future, they say they essentially say assume perfect people, and now having assumed perfect people we'll all behave perfectly and we'll all be happy. I don't do that. So when you say that it's necessary to have means of, of, of holding people accountable, having means sometimes of dealing with deviations, with violations, I agree with you. But what's interesting, I think, is that that function is no different than any other function, right? In other words, the people doing that have balanced job complexes. 
And the people doing that are remunerated for how long they work, how hard they work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which they work. They can't get ahead. They can't exploit. And, and neither can anybody else. And they can't um, uh, aggrandize to themselves more voting say. Now, is it possible that somebody could be not even maliciously at all, right? Um, very good speaker, very good thinker, and comes up with lots of interesting ideas which have merit, yes. And, and one isn't saying, well, let's eliminate that kind of expertise, far from it. One wants that kind of expertise, but one wants to understand that, let's say you have tremendous expertise in some area, you don't know my preferences better than me, right? And you don't know other people's preferences better than them. So what you have to do is convey this knowledge and the logic that says to you, the outcome should be X to us. Uh, and, and then we have to decide that, well, we agree, we vote for X, right? And, and that's what has to happen. Now, if you've got somebody who's, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly what kinds of violations there could be. Sometimes I get in trouble with some leftists, and especially at this moment in time, when I, if somebody will ask me, well, would you have police in a good society? I'm talking about, say, a good society. But you're saying, would you have people to, um, uh, uh, to hold people responsible for the economic decision behavior? And well, the answer is yes. I think to actually, I mean, to, to put a fine point on it, I think what I have in mind is like, if some person in the organization starts to assume outsized informal power, who puts them back into their, you know, how, how do you, what, how, how do you? I, the answer would be, if you need that, right, then, then that's a job inside the, the workplace. And it's a balanced job, complex yeah. job. And those people have the responsibility to do it and they're recallable. So that would be the answer. But I don't know what it means, and this would be a longer discussion, that they assume some sort of external power. It's not obvious to me that it's possible with balanced job complexes, with people informed, with equitable remuneration. And why are they doing it, right? Are they doing it to aggrandize themselves? They can't. Are they doing it just because they're psychotic and, and you know, like Trump, they want to exert themselves? Well, then that has to be dealt with. No, I agree with you. Um, just like somebody's a killer, it has to be dealt with. Okay. Okay. So let, let's move on. There's a bunch of stuff sure. to cover and we've got some great questions. So one, one more quick one is, uh, or maybe it's not, but let's try to go quickly so we can get the more audience. Or I'll try and go faster so you can get more. No, it's all, it's all good. The, uh, um, uh, so you mentioned um, a few criteria for how people should be compensated. So long, long work, hard work, onerous conditions, and then also socially valued work. Right. So well, that's that that's a condition that oversees all of it. In other okay. words, if I do socially valued work, then I get income for how long I work, how hard I work and the onerousness of the conditions. If I'm not doing socially valued work, I'm not I don't get remunerated. Sure. Okay. So so I mean, I mean, sort of an, I'm sure you get this question a lot, like in the absence of a market or, you know, who, who's adjudicating these all these variables. I mean, who's adjudicating whether the work is socially valued and who's adjudicating how long you're working? I mean, how long you're working is fairly objective, but okay. you know, how, how hard you're working. How long, how hard and onerousness, it's the workers' council. It's self-managed, okay? They're dividing up the tasks. They're creating these balanced jobs. For the most part, onerousness is gonna be comparable for everybody, right? That okay. It's only under a harsh condition somebody takes on some terrible situation. Uh, and as far as duration, you measure that with a clock. And as far as intensity, you, you can actually pay attention to output as an indicator of intensity and also duration, precisely because the work has to be socially valuable. If I say I worked 10 hours and I worked really hard and I produced this, right, a, a little tiny bit, something's wrong. I, that's not socially valuable. I'm not using those 10 hours well. I'm not using my hard labor well. So that's the idea. It, it, I mean, it's a bigger discussion, but it, it, uh, that's the process. And when you say, well, who determines if it's socially valuable? Well, that's the planning system, the participatory planning system. It's not a question of whether some God says that's good. It's a question of whether the population wants it. If I want to play tennis, as, my, as part of my job, 
it has to be the case that people want to watch that, 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 you know, that, that, that it has social value. It wouldn't. So I can't. Right. But, you know, so isn't, I mean, isn't that another, haven't you created another market there? I mean, it, no. you know, if, the, why not? Yeah. Well, in a market, buyers and sellers confront each other, right? And they basically try and fleece each other. And, and if one does better, the other does worse. That's the way a market works. Everybody will admit that. All economists will admit that. Um, there's no planning. There's no oversight of the 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 in the individual choice in light of the whole situation each actor functions as an independent entity that's supposed to be the virtue of markets it's in fact why they are calamitous um, it means that ecological effects aren't accounted for social effects on social relations aren't accounted for even human effects aren't accounted for the only thing that's accounted for is what you say you want what i say i want what I say I'll sell for, what you say you'll sell for. And that isn't even accounted for. That is simply imposed by our bargaining power. Now, what am I describing yeah. instead? I'm describing a situation where, well, if I want to play tennis, people have to like it. There's a tennis workers council. There's a community. If nobody wants to see me play tennis, it's not a job that is socially remunerated. I can play for my fun. But it can't be a job for which I'm contributing to the social product. See, the social product is something that people want. They don't want that. If I'm, if I'm producing polluting cars for some reason, right, and the public doesn't want it, I can't do it and say it's socially valuable. So you're thinking, okay, market means people expressing wants and people expressing capacities. But that's not, that's much... That's giving markets too much sway. People can express what they want and can express what they want to do. And it's not a market. It's instead a cooperative negotiation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely, I see what you mean that I see how it would, could uh, take account of externalities in a way that the yeah. way we were set up markets doesn't, doesn't now, but it still seems to me like in a sense, the council is like the customer who you're trying to impress. So. But the trying to impress. Well, it's an interesting point. No workers' council has an interest in selling more stuff than people need. That's exactly the opposite of now, right? In other words, workplaces yeah. now have an interest in convincing you that you need things that you don't need, right? They actually have an interest in doing that, and they spend fortunes doing it. There is no gain for a workers' council in just increasing volume. Their income is not a function of that. Their income is a function of duration, intensity, and onerousness of socially valued labor. And it's not gonna go off the charts because they managed to trick everybody into thinking that they need something, right? A super air conditioner, it's way more than anybody needs. So, I mean, it's a long discussion. I mean, a whole new economy is a big thing, but, but these are very good questions and I wish I could take longer to, you know, to address them. Are there, is there any more? Do we have a little more time? Yeah, I guess. We yeah, can. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm doing the audience a terrible disservice by not getting to. So <laughs> let's let's get to some of these. So, so this one, um, so this one, I I think to put it in context, I think it's getting at um, something you said early on, which is that you know you we want to say in decisions to the extent that they affect us. So uh, Paul asks, um, how could um, or no? That's not the right question. Um, okay. Paul, so Paul asks. Uh, what do you think about age-weighted voting? So get, giving the young more votes than the old insofar as policies enacted tomorrow will affect the young more? I don't know. I mean, maybe lots of questions are, what do you think people in the future should decide? Right? You understand? I don't care. I don't want to say what I think they should decide. They're going to decide. So there are all sorts, how long should the workday be? I don't know. That's for people in the future to figure out, given how much stuff they want, given the ecological implications, given their effects of work on them, et cetera, et cetera. What I want is self-management. Um, if, if the questioner is right, that's one way to deal with it. But another way to deal with it that makes a little more sense to me is that it's called investment. 
It's we're investing some of our some of our product in the future. We're investing in new equipment, new approaches, new research, et cetera, et cetera. Also, we're looking at the ecological effects that are going to come down the road, right? Um, I, I it it may make you know what the person is suggesting may make sense, um, but I I think it's. I think it's probably going too far in a kind of a mechanical direction, but I don't know. And it doesn't matter what I think, because that's the kind of thing that would emerge as a system is put in place and people arrive at what works and what doesn't and what they want and what they don't. Um, okay. All right, so this is from Axo Sal. Uh, many tend to leave out money creation from economic discussions. Currently it's done by banks through credit. What improvements can be done there? Uh, can QF help? And by, uh, by, by QF, um, the question means uh, quadratic funding, which is, you, you may or may not be familiar with that, one of, uh, one of the ideas that we've, we've worked with. Um, the Exchange Foundation. I, uh, I hope I won't offend anybody. Um, when I say that I do not think um, these issues are the heart of the issue. For me, the heart of the issue is thinking in terms, you don't even have to think in terms of money at all. You can just think in terms of, well, the economy is producing a gigantic pie. How much does everybody get? What size slice and what composition does everybody get? Money is just a tool, right? That, that is employed in different societies in different ways to facilitate getting pieces of the pie and also to corrupt, to distort um, what kinds of pieces people get, bigger or smaller, better or worse, and so on. Um, what, what I've said that it bears upon those issues are that remuneration, the amount of pie you get, should be a function of how long you work, how hard you work, and the onerousness of the conditions under which you work. You don't, you, you could do it with, with indices. You don't even need to, to, you know, to circulate money. And that should be obvious from the fact that right now, lots of people don't, don't use money. They just use credit cards. They just use, um, um, you know, representations of what they're entitled to, the share that they're entitled to. Uh, things like interest and loans. I mean, these are more detailed questions. They are changed. They do change a lot. It's still in a participatory economy. It ought to be possible to borrow in order to, uh, you know, do something that takes more and that you pay back over time. That that should be possible. But who are you paying back? It's not a bank. It, it's basically your share of the social product, right? I'm taking some. I'm getting less later. Um, that kind of dynamic is what what's hidden in in the discussions of money. So from anonymous. Um, does a singular focus on owner slash worker means of production issues leave big tech free to advance their domination of the means of consumption? Wait, the, the last part of that, can you repeat? Does the emphasis on onerousness of work mean that? No, no, uh, sorry. The, does, a, does a singular focus on owner slash worker oh, okay. uh, means of production issues leave big tech free to advance their domination of the means of consumption? Uh, no, um, it just means that in this discussion, we've only talked about the production side. Um, the, the consumption side is individuals, uh, neighborhoods, and consumer councils, and networks of consumer councils. And they're interacting with the producers because they're together, right, cooperatively negotiating because it does affect everyone. What's produced affects the workers producing it, and it, protects, it affects the people who want to consume stuff. Right, so it affects everyone. So everyone has an input into this process that plans it. But no, there's no, there's no um, mechanism in the full picture, I believe, by which basically anyone can systematically, uh, um, you know, diminish the uh, the well-being of others or aggrandize themselves. One could steal something, one could beat somebody up. I mean, those kinds of things remain possible. They just become much less likely because there's much less motivation because people are well off materially and have dignified circumstances and excellent education and so on and so forth. Um, so that reduces all of that. Maybe it doesn't go to zero. There might still be some rape. There might still be, you know, et cetera. 
Um, but but no, uh, I, I, I think a full re presentation would deal with the question, uh, but we didn't talk about the consumption side. Where does the actual economic computation happen in this if we don't have markets or centralization? That's the thing called participatory planning. It's a good question. It, it's the thing called participatory planning. And there's more than one way to do it. Um, and some of the advocates have some differences over, you know, features of it. But the idea is something like this. We have workers council. So in, a, in each workplace, there's a workers so council. Just a heads up, we've got like 30 seconds. Oh, well, that's, that's a tough question to answer <laughs> in 30 seconds. Um, visit ZNet, <laughs> there's lots of, or go on Google and look up participatory economics. And I promise you, these questions and other similar ones are dealt with or addressed, maybe you won't find it compelling, but they are addressed in detail, not only in presentations of the whole model, but specifically addressing the questions uh, because they're raised all the time. Um, uh, so I guess that's our 30 seconds. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Michael. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. I hope it was you know, you can't see the audience, so I have no idea. There could be two people, or there could be 400,000, and they could all be charging their computers with pitchforks, or maybe they're all smiling like you are. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.